Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, I'm Anita Taylor, and I'm the Dean of Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design. And it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody this evening for the first of the Drawn to Dundee programmes held in association with the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize. Um, it's a real delight because drawing is deep in the DNA of Duncan of Jordanston across all of our programmes and subjects. And I'm really delighted that Professor Tanya Kovats, who's our Professor of Making and Drawing, will be um, chairing the event this evening. But first of all, I'm going to set a little context for the event before you uh, get to hear from our fabulous speakers this evening. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize because this is the very first event. And I'm the director of the exhibition. I founded it with a co-founder in 1994. So it's a long-standing exhibition. Um, so the exhibition is an open call exhibition established in 1994 to think about who was drawing, what they were drawing, why they were drawing, what we could call a drawing and how we could use that to inflect and inform both higher education. I was the head of painting at the University of Gloucestershire at the time and how we could build an infrastructure around the nature of contemporary drawing, uh, not just in the UK, but across the world at that time. The Drawing Prize has been supported by a whole range of benefactors, including its starting point with the precursor of the Higher Education Innovation Funds, Enterprise in Higher Education, and then a range of charities. We've had 17 years of funding from the Jerwood Charitable Foundation from 2001 to 2017, and we're now funded by the Trinity Boy Wharf Trust. So since 2018, the poster on your left uh, all the way through to 2021 and into 2022. We'll be announcing the um, selection uh, process very shortly. So Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize 2021, like all of the uh, previous exhibitions, has a panel of three. Uh, and the selectors were Sheila Gowda, the artist based in Bangalore in India, Simon Groom, who you'll be hearing from this evening, and Zoe Whitley from Chisholm Hale. And we have within the project now a separate submission for a Working Drawing Award, which is very particular and special to our sponsors. Um, and the Trinity Boy Wolf Working Draw Drawing Prize aims to think about what a working drawing is and how we use drawing in terms of creating ideation and making drawings that result in other things, so products, architecture, painting, sculptures, all sorts of things that we use drawing for. So it's drawing as thinking and ideation. Um, the fundamental reason to set up the drawing prize is to think about drawing as a fundamental means of communication and expression. And that sense of it being as part of a creative endeavor in higher education and in making throughout the range of practices of many artists. Um, and the selection process is long and involved. Uh, it involves receiving, and we, as we did this year, 3,300 drawings to choose from, to choose an exhibition from. The image on the right is the selection process at Trinity Boy Wharf uh, in London. So where our sponsors live, they provide us with selection space and exhibition space. And the image on the left is the selection taking place at Wimbledon School of Art, where the project was housed for some years with Michael Craig Martin, Kate Brindley, and Charlotte Mullins. Um, this is just a set of contacts. Trinity Boy Wharf is in London. It has the last remaining lighthouse. You now understand the logo. Uh, we produce uh, an illustrated publication every year to go alongside the exhibition. And we produce a range of collaterals. Since we went online in 2020, uh, we've produced a film and a whole range of online events. And you can see from the image on the left, it's opposite the Millennium Dome. The project starts in London with the awards announcements. So this is the 2021 announcements in London. And there are awards that we give. The, the awards are quite significant. Uh, a first prize, a second prize, a student award, because we believe in supporting students uh, to draw and encouraging that, and also a working drawing award. This year, we also have the Evelyn Williams Trust Award, which is a bursary of £10,000 to produce, contribute to producing solo exhibition for Hastings Contemporary. Um, and these are just images of the work on show in Trinity Boy Wharf. We launched in the chain store. We then exhibited in their new space, the Boy Store, at the back of the chain store. 
uh, where next year the exhibition will be launched and delivered uh, in September to October. The exhibition is publication is available at Cooper Gallery. And we've also produced uh, a, an education pack. So we worked with Drawing is Free to produce an education pack, which everyone can download for free. So we're really thinking about how we encourage drawing and build a community of drawing through the exhibition, both as a resource for artists and makers of drawings, but also for educators, for people in an earlier stage of their career, and for anybody who wants to draw. So our aim is to get everybody drawing, to get everybody talking about drawing, and to build a community through drawing. Those online events have included discussions, films, all sorts of things that are available on the Drawing Projects UK YouTube channel. And they reign, and, and I'm sure that many people in the audience today have been involved uh, in watching uh, and engaging in many of those events as we've run through the tour from September right the way through to this program being delivered by uh, Tanya Kovats and Alex Roberts in association with the wonderful Cooper Gallery uh, in Dundee at Duncan of Jordanstone. So the exhibition continues to the 16th of April. We encourage everyone to come and see it. It's a great amount of drawings to see, 114 in total, 101 selected for the main awards. And the call for entries will open in April. Thank you. And just to say what an honour it is to work with my team at Duncan of Jordanstone, the Cooper Gallery, Tanya Kovats, Alex Roberts, all of the team who are really committed and excited by drawing. But I'm going to hand over to Tanya, who's chairing the event this evening, to introduce everyone. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Anita. That was a wonderful little whirlwind tour of the enormous project that is Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize. Um, so the, this series of events is called Drawn to Dundee. Uh, it's a programme of workshops as well as online talks um, that myself and my wonderful colleague Alex Roberts have convened and we're very grateful for the invitation to do so. Um, and we've been well supported by the great team at the Cooper Gallery, so many thanks. Um, and we set out right from the beginning to program a series of events and workshops that expand this wonderful conversation around the breadth and depth of discourse around drawing. And also to encourage people to make drawings as well. Uh, drawing runs through everything at Duncan of Jordanstone College of Art and Design, expanding and adding to this ever evolving creative form. And you'll find it everywhere in the life room, in design labs, in studios, for visualising medical knowledge or new comics, illustrations or gaming, uh, drawings with speculations and drawings with purpose, drawings for problem solving daydreaming and imagining. Uh, DJ CAD runs a range of different drawing courses, in co including short upskilling drawing courses. And we're also going to be starting a new MFA taught postgraduate in drawing in September, which I'm very excited about. As we celebrate drawing here tonight, it's with the intention to encourage our audience members to have a kind of after ripple from these conversations. Um, so I have um, invited all our panel members to um, make a drawing prompt that you might want to take away and uh, follow up in your own time. Um, these will be available through the Cooper Gallery website as afterthoughts based on the material that our wonderful panel chosen to share with us this evening. Because I believe we all draw and anything we can do to encourage that is a good thing. Um, our panel has a particularly Scottish focus to celebrate the arrival of Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize in Dundee. Um, and uh, this evening we'll run uh, with various panel members from the arts professionals to incredible range of artists that uh, and they will all be sharing their reflections on drawing. So um, I'm going to introduce us to um, the panel members before I invite the first um, person to speak and present. So Simon Groom 
is our first speaker. He's the Director of Modern and Contemporary Art, the National Gallery Galleries of Scotland, which is in Edinburgh. Uh, Simon's worked as a curator at Kettles Yard, Cambridge, head of exhibitions at Tate Liverpool, with a special interest in art from Asia Pacific region before joining the National Galleries of Scotland. He was also one of the esteemed collectors for this year's selectors of the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize, which is uh, no small task. There's a huge amount of drawings to look at, consider and select. Um, so he will be sharing his thoughts on drawing and possibly his thoughts on that process of being a selector. Our second speaker this evening is Lucy Byatt, the Director of Hospital Fields in our growth. So if you follow the Tay to the coast and turn left, head north, um, you'll come to our growth and uh, the wonderful um, cultural resource that is Hospital Fields, quite a magical place to visit. Since 2021, she's devised a dynamic public programme based on supporting artists through residency opportunities and the development of new commissions made for the programme at Hospital Field and for public platforms elsewhere across the world. She directs a public programme that reflects a strong commitment to working with contemporary artists, as well as care of and engagement with Hospital Field's fascinating heritage and collection. And drawings are a strong part of that collection. So Lucy will be sharing some of her reflections um, on, that, on those collections. Um, some of you may have visited Hospital Fields recently, um, to see our next speakers, um, Jade Monserrat's remarkable work, Live Charcoal, which happened last September. Jade Monserrat was a recipient of the Stuart Hall Foundation scholars, Scholarship, supporting her PhD, Race Representation in Northern Britain in the Context of the Black Atlantic. She was also awarded one of the two Jerwood Student Dra Drawing Prizes in 2017, no Need for Clothing, uh, which was a remarkable drawing performance and installation that took place at Cooper Gallery. More recently, um, Innova and Manchester Art Gallery commissioned Jade as the first artist for the Future Collective project, which is an evolving work where Jade shares her research as well as recent completed works in a, in a work that's still emerging called Constellation Care and Resistance, which was actually lucky enough to see the other weekend. Uh, absolutely wonderful collection of, of works on paper and works directly onto the wall. So as I mentioned, some of you may have seen her live charcoal durational artwork at Hospital Fields last September, which centred around traditional earth burn or charcoal burn, so creating one of the oldest drawing materials. Our next speaker is Natsumi Sakamoto. She's an artist based in Glasgow who creates multimedia installations that include film, drawing and animation. Her practice employs oral tradition to examine memories of hidden history through a feminist lens. She explores the politics of women's work and gender roles embodied in the intangible heritage of superstitions, songs and everyday ritual passed down through intergenerational memory. So we'll be hearing more from Natsumi. Our next speaker is Callum Wallace who grew up in Rosshire, moving in 2013 to study fine art at Duncan of Jordanston in Dundee. So he's one of our alumni. And uh, Callum lives in, has continued to live in Dundee. His practice asks questions of how humans relate to the natural world, posing them in the form of remarkable drawings made in and of and with the landscape. His, drawing his drawings ponder the roles of memory and expectation in our experience of nature and a deeper level of memory that's held within the earth. Olivia Plender is our final speaker. Um, Plender's work often starts with research into social movements and their histories because what we think we know about the past inevitably shapes what we believe is possible in the future. She often works with drawings 
Um, recent exhibitions include the School of Creators, the Art of Learning from 1960s to the present, um, Life Support and Not Without My Ghosts, which is the Hayward Toying exhibition. Um, her drawings are presented sometimes in sort of comic form uh, that make their own publications. So a wide range of drawing practice is being shared with you this evening um, and reflections on drawings that are in uh, various people's collections as well. So with no further ado, I will pass over to Simon for the first presentation of this evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tanya. Um, really happy to be here. Um, just to say it's a fantastic experience to be part of the um, jury for the um, prize. And uh, having seen it on Saturday, I think it looks fantastic at um, the Cooper Gallery. have done their amazing work, as always. Um, this is a very subjective take on uh, drawing. Um, and I'm going to continue the whirlwind that um, Anita began um, with a gallop through uh, some of my own favourites. Uh, what I love about drawing is its uh, kind of ambiguous status. Uh, Tanya, it's great to hear that Duncan Jordanston uh, paint, uh, drawing is central. Um, we often hear about, uh, you know, the great um, barrage of criticism that uh, is levelled at artists and they can't draw. So it occupies that kind of status um, as a practice. At the same time as which, uh, drawing is the most democratic form of, um, of all art activity. You take a stick and a wall and uh, you make a mark. That's drawing. Uh, so you go from that. Um, and I'm looking around and, um, you know, on my walls, I realise that uh, drawings are the thing that I have the most, most of, uh, because they're affordable. Uh, I love them. Um, and because, you know, drawing is so much, it goes from the single point spooling out in line, in time, to uh, the materiality, the mysterious materiality of graphite that's uh, dark. So I'm going to uh, do a run through these um, drawings. Um, I've got about, I don't know, we'll see as we go along. So the first one is Bette Lowe, and uh, if I look just above my screen, I'm looking at this picture now. Uh, it's a drawing I picked up a few years ago, um, and I love it, just because, again, the materiality of the graphite. Uh, Bette Lowe studied at Glasgow School of Art uh, during the Second World War, continued her studies in 1945 at a hospital field, actually, that uh, Lucy represents, can speak after me. Uh, she was part of left-wing groups, got involved in theatre, design, everything. But part of it, but uh, and became, uh, and her drawings and paintings during the war were quite expired by German Expressionism. Um, and then uh, she fell in love with Orkney and uh, that idea of uh, the land and the sky and the sea coming together in this very abstract movement is what I love about it. It's a very bad reproduction, unfortunately, but you can just see enough in there to see that uh, it, it's just completely abstract uh, and it's the movement of the pencil marks that really make it. It's quite small, it's about 20 centimetres by about uh, 14, 15 up, but it's dense and uh, and wonderful. By chance, I found a painting that uh, is um, seems to be very similar to that, almost identical um, size in North Lancashire Council Museum and Heritage Service called Moon and Clouds. So um, maybe it's just a, a maybe that's what the weather's always like on Orkney. I don't know. Stormy passage, Moon and Clouds, all looks the same. Land sea coming together, but I love it. Uh, something very different. So that's more descriptive. And um, this is another drawing that I love by Kishio Suga. He's a Japanese artist, part of the Monohar group from the late 60s, early 70s. Still works today. We put a show on of him, uh, paired him with Carla Black, contemporary uh, Glaswegian artist uh, at the galleries a couple of years ago. This is very simply two sheets of sandpaper. And the artist has taken a crayon, uh, a chalk, and has just literally rubbed the chalk over the surface, starting very heavily on the top right, uh, top left-hand corner, and got lighter and lighter as he goes towards the bottom right-hand corner, and then finished it off by chalking a bit of string and just whacking it on across the uh, diagonals of the canvas. So it is is where the material meets the surface, and that's what Monohar is all about: is the way that objects interrelate in space and come together, and that friction that they have. And this says it in such a beautiful, simple, essential way. Um, and this is something very different. I lived in Italy for a while, actually after Japan, and um, um, I picked this up in 1993. And I love this because it's, uh, it, uh, it, it's an attempt, this is the headline on uh, the local newspaper. 
to try and identify the uh, two robbers um, who had uh, carried out this uh, daring raid. And um, the drawings I just thought were wonderful. So I love that idea that uh, a national newspaper or a local newspaper will identify whoever it is through these drawings. So it operates both from materiality to that kind of figurative idea. And there's something magic about the idea of mark making that can then reproduce what it is to be a person or the essence of a person. They're kind of descriptive. I don't know whether the uh, robbers were ever caught based on that description. Who knows? So it's the relation to the reality, which I think is really, really important and is the essence of art, but certainly of drawing. And that plays out in many, many ways. This is a drawing which isn't in my collection. Unfortunately, it's in the uh, Gallery of Modern Arts collection by Mary Hartnett, who started drawing and painting at Edinburgh College of Art in, and graduated in 2006. And she takes these film stills. So if you look at the size of it, it's tiny. She takes these film stills from films and um, recreates a scene in them and from a trailer and she doesn't watch it it's about the kind of spaces it's about the formal uh, composition of the work rather than anything to do with narrative but in terms of detail they are utterly utterly remarkable so i don't know what was happening at edinburgh at that time but here's an even smaller drawing and uh, this is by an artist called paul chape who was one year behind murray um, and graduated in 2007 from edinburgh college of art and again, if you look at this, this is three by five. It's a group photograph and uh, you really need a magnifying glass to be able to see it. This is also in the gallery's uh, collection, not in mine, unfortunately. And uh, if you see how many figures are crammed into that. And then if you look even more closely, you can begin to see that in the middle, there's uh, Laurel on the top and Hardy. Hardy's on the top, Laurel's in the second row down. So again, it's that manipulation of reality, looking close um, that again, um, drawing does so well. Charles Aver is a Scottish artist uh, who uh, moved to London um, a while ago, but uh, still retains very close links with um, with Scotland. And um, I'm going to show you three drawings by him just to show you kind of the evolution of taste. What I love about this is that um, it's very fluid, the line. So you have one figure who's repeated a number of times to give that sense of dynamism to a line. The forms are traced or outlined, it's very free, very fluid. But that idea of a line making something and the making becoming part of your mind and imagining and putting together what it is, I think gives a sense of reality even as it begins to unwind itself. Um, so these are all part of, this is in the gallery's collection, it's a much larger drawing. So again, this is about 10 years later. Um, and Charles has based his life on, um, or his work, certainly over the last 20, 30 years, uh, on one project called The Islanders. And it's about kind of imagining, um, expanding uh, this uh, story about, uh, based very much on uh, Mull from where uh, Charles comes and where he still uh, lives a lot of uh, the year round. And um, he's elaborated a huge mythology uh, that mixes both observation, drawing from observation, but also theory and uh, quite complex, actually, uh, intellectual thought and brings it together to create this amazing realm, which is as real to him. And he makes it real in its evocation so that here, 20 years later, we've gone from that very early kind of quite uh, free fluid drawing to something like this that is kind of astonishing, both in the terms and, and uh, ranges of drawings that come together. So you have that architectural drawing that is based on architectural models uh, with the freedom of uh, the um, with the figure drawings to make up a completely uh, made up scene. It's unreal, but it has that sense of reality, which is utterly extraordinary. And I think is very uh, seductive in his work. Something very different, uh, Via Selman's, uh, again, is part of the gallery's collection. Um, who is a Latvian-American visual artist, best known for uh, photorealistic um, paintings and drawings. Again, these are based on observation. And I love the way that she brings these two together. Um, um, so macro, micro, coming together, difference of scale, uh, and creates this sense of reality that, of course, you can't really inhabit. Um, the artist has said, um, I'm creating a flat invented world. Imagination comes in from building an image that is physical reality with some real staying power. I try to make a work that is thoroughly considered and has a strong form. It's in the nuances of the way the graphite feels and the marks that are left. And the last work I'm going to talk about is Jane Dixon. And Jane Dixon also works in graphite on gesso. 
And here you have the idea of two bodies. The canvas becomes a skin. There's a sense of real reality about these. It's like um, the marks are made through graphite on gesso that are uncovered. So it's almost like the canvas becomes a skin that gets bruised in the making. And they're based on dummies. So they're a surrogate for the, for the human body. But they are beautiful uh, in their complexity and tone. And um, I'd say it's one of my favourite works of art of all time. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, insight into some of your favourite drawings. That was really a wonderful bit of sharing and, and demonstrates how, how elusive defining what a drawing is and what a good drawing is as well, because that, that depends on so many factors coming together. But that was a really rich insight. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Lucy Byatt, who's also a custodian of a remarkable drawing collection at Hospital Fields and also helps many new drawings come into existence. So thank you, Lucy, if you wanted to share. OK, so let's get started, shall we? I, I, what I was trying to do here is to show. Um, so what I wanted to show really is the way in which we view some of the elements of the story of Hospital Field and the collections of Hospital Field to inspire and to, um, to give a sort of anchor to our current contemporary programme. So this is, this is Hospital Field, it's a heritage house for those who have never been here, surrounded by fields and also a nice community. These are our people around us in their houses. And one of the things that when I first came here was astonished to find is this small capsule collection by an artist called Francis Place, who was a York artist who was um, related to um, Patrick Allen Fraser, who is the benefactor, really, the, the artist who formed and created Hospital Field as a, an art school. And this, this was his wife's uh, relative. Um, and, and this collection, which and here is an artist who um, was born in 1647, died in 1748. So if you think that um, some of the works that he made and that are in our collection were were made around the time of the Great Fire of London. So these are these are extraordinary objects. So there's a series of drawings here, and because of the age of them and the texture of the paper and so on, as I say, one can't help but think of the materiality of them as objects, but also because of because it was before photography drawing had this enormous weight of, of, of responsibility in a way to communicate um, what what an object was so the, the 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 way in which the head of this dead swan the way the weight of it the weight of the body on the on the table this is this is all incredibly important within within these drawings these lovely um, it, it, images of peonies, that, that, but also we can see the kind of foxing of the, of the paper and the edges of the paper. And it's really, really important to us as we plan Hospital Field's future to be thinking about how we make it possible for our audiences and for people to know that we've got these little hidden away collections. And these are quite large drawings. They're probably about... Um, 500 by, by half a meter by about um, 300 something like that and then this is this beautiful rock formation um, uh, obviously on a distressed piece of paper you can hardly believe that it's managed through the kind of chaos of hospital field to still be alive but it, it is an extraordinary Pyrenees sort of um, classicism in the background and then so so I put, I'm put it into put the sort of some three historic elements together to to give a kind of the foundation for 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 our drawing uh, our commitment to drawing um and when patrick allen fraser was in london he was part of a sketching group called the clique and this was a group of artists that met together you know that's absolutely something that's that we are so important to us all now is that is the way that we share and see and work together and Richard Dad, this is a picture drawing of, of Richard, Richard Dad, the artist who was probably became the most famous artist within that group. Um, but it was very influential, that group on Hospital Field and our collection, because um, other members of it, uh, John Phillip um, and so, were, 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 became absolute 
bosom friends of Alan Fraser and he collected their work. We've got a lot of their drawings and their paintings in our collections, but particularly about um, Richard Dad. Um, this is probably his most famous painting. Famously, he was psychotic and he um, was imprisoned in Bedlam, which is now the Imperial War Museum. Um, and uh, it, but he was allowed to paint and he painted these extraordinary paintings of these fairies. This is the, the fairies fellas master stroke uh, painted in 1864. So this was really current to our history here where Alan Fraser was um, commissioning the artists that he knew from this drawing group um, to make works for his collection. And his great friend, John Phillips, then married. Um, oh, I've forgotten I put that image in. It's irresistible, isn't it? It's Richard Dad, um, extraordinary dancing fairies under the, under the toadstool. Um, this is a, a, a painting by John Philip, who was a Scottish painter, who's Queen Victoria's favourite painter. You know, these were these were young artists in London, but when they came back to Scotland, having been educated in Paris and so on, they they became the kind of establishment painters. But um, John um, married Maria Dad. Um, this is his painting. It's called The Artist and His Wife. Um, and within our archives, there is this great sense of care because she is also um, really unwell, huge mental health issues um, and a very untypically for a Victorian family um, with our archives tell us that um, he sends the children away for their own safety so that he can look after his wife. And this painting is in the collection in Aberdeen Art Gallery. So really it's that drawing group that, um, that inspired so much of um, of, of the collections here at Hospital Field and the act of artists drawing together. Patrick Allen Fraser is the polymath. So th this is a, a letter in, in our um, collections here. Um, and Alan Fraser has, he's really interested in the, the, the parliament, the Westmint, Westmint, the parliament buildings are being built. And he is really interested to know how they're being built because at the same time he's building Hospital Field. It says here in this letter, that there's no, there's as yet no book published about the Houses of Parliament, but the foreman uh, of the Masons has told me, has, has given me a drawing of, of the way in which he's constructing the, the, the building. So, if, and still in our archive, which is something we've found quite recently, is this tiny little scrunched up piece of paper um, that has all the measurements of how the building is being built with this little drawing. And so my proposition to to people to draw is to ask a friend to draw something that they're interested in and for, for them to send them that drawing, like a drawing exchange. And this is this is a really beautiful little line drawing that I've exploded here. Um, you have to see it to believe it, but it's but it, I think my fascination really is in the conversation between these two people and his inquiry and the fact that the only way he could find this out is through this drawing, which was drawn by the, the mason who was building the Houses of Parliament at the time. And that's this is the other side of the piece of paper, which tells exactly the, the measurements of the of, of the of the way in which the, the building is being constructed. And then our program here at Hospital Field. Um, so you can uh, quite often find lots of people doing things with drawing here, and this is partly because, well, obviously inspired by the fact that drawing is so much part of our collection, but also that we set up a residency program for artists that live and work quite close to us because quite quickly we realized that artists from very close to us didn't really need those month-long residencies we needed to work with them in a different way and the drawing school was the project that emerged out of that and so that it, that's a project where we work with artists to engage audiences in drawing but also to develop their own practice and this this planting in the grass here is the shadow of a former sculpture that we commissioned Mary Mary Redmond's um, sculpture um, for Hospital Field, which left this great shadow on the grass, and we planted these these um, uh, wildflowers in, so they became a real magnet for all sorts of drawing. And then we come to um, much more recent commissions. So um, last year we opened the gardens. In fact, that feels like this massive leap from that drawing two years to this to this commission with McPeter, where he made a series of sculptures for the grounds here, but really inspired through his drawing practice, very important um, core to, to, 
to all, all his work. Um, he developed this process, um, I think it's his first commission outside um, using these materials. And of course, he's using images and objects from inside the house and um, using his usual comic um, approach to, uh, to, to drawing. And then we commissioned him to make these tables in, in the cafe here where he spent a long time working through our archives, working through all our collections, choosing items from the collection and um, using them as the and drawing them and so that we could we could use this process to um, impregnate them into the tables. And then of course the wonderful Jade Montserrat. Um, I hope you don't mind me using these Im images, Jade, I haven't um, discussed with you, but I'm sure you won't mind. Um, so uh, as mentioned before, the um, charcoal the charcoal burn that um, we we worked with Jade on last year. I think you know we got to know Jade through the residency program, and that is absolutely so important to um, the way that we work and the, the the closeness that we have with artists because it's quite an unusual place, Hospitalville, to make work. But if an artist comes to us and says, "I want to do a five day charcoal burn," I mean. We can't really resist that, can we? Especially if we have an artist as charismatic who can actually, although this is an image from the performance at the end of the five days, it is the gesture that I think of Jade in terms of her conducting of the event, of organising over the five days a whole series of events while the cons constant burning of the charcoal, which is for, for us this fantastic, med almost, well, medieval, process that still exists today, that exists in every culture, that uses the, the, the land to produce something that's going to burn, that's going to keep you warm, but also is something that of course we all draw with. And um, and so we have this uh, great event. So we, uh, so a, a lot of our work actually is is event based that doesn't ultimately end up with a with a with a um, a drawing that's, that we put on the wall, but it, it uses drawing as part of that process of exchange, of conversation, of art making, um, of impression making, and so on. And um, these easels, which of course are the traditional form of of, of how you draw, and um, they still they are still really um, important to us. And we have easels here from the 19th century. These aren't they then, of course, but. Um, it is this indication of, of an art school, um, and so this is so this is part of of that performance, which really um, it was it was felt to me as though this was a five day process through which we all passed at various intervals during that time, which culminated with high highs and lows throughout, and then just as Jade um, started her performance, the sun came out, which was absolutely fantastic. Lucy, thank you, thank you so much for sharing that that wonderful sense of continuity and and really quite deep time <laughs> in relation to drawing at hospital fields and bringing us right up to this moment as well. Um, and without further ado, I will hand over this moment to the wonderful Jade Monserrat. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Lucy. Um, uh, thank you. Um, for um, inviting me. It was really great to see live charcoal and I'll speak about this drawing that you can see on the screen and actually live charcoal is a development from um, this and um, uh, called No Need for Clothing and actually um, uh, I'm very grateful to Scottish um, organisations for um, giving me the opportunities to d develop my work at sort of um, uh, in my own sort of space and time and um, with a, a, a sort of vision in mind, which um, is very special. Um, I think of drawing as a mode um, for living in the world. I think drawing is similar to speaking and therefore like performance, the trace we make could be conversation, movements, gesture, 
drawing, writing and speech are all modes for human interaction. Through conversation there is a line, a thread, points of connection, as with drawing. No drawing or performance is wrong, in my view. That sense of doing things wrong is what limits everyone's access to spaces for creativity and also our own potential for creativity. No need for clothing, an iterative drawing in installation, um, which was conceived in 2017 at um, uh, Cooper. Um, um, I, I first performed it as a spoken um, work at Spike Island, thanks to Evan F. Akoya, who was invited um, um, as part of the Labena Himid exhibition there earlier in that year. My um, brown, oftentimes naked body responds to an embodied sense of relief from trauma when making this work, as well as a hyper alert awareness of the structures my citizen body is contained by. I subject my hyper visible body to spectacularization while making no need for clothing, drawing out letters to form words on a physically human scale, scratching surfaces with the exclamation that this work is about mourning invisibilized, vulnerable, precarious, criminalized and tortured lives in solidarity with such movements as Black Lives Matter and all campaigns against violence as part of the intergenerational liberation movement. Um, a term um, that's been reiterated to me through um, the incredible um, um, Celeste Marie Bernier, who I've been lucky enough to consult um, whilst I'm on residency here in Hoik. Um, um, uh, with Alchemy Film and Arts Festival. Um, Frederick Douglass made an impromptu um, um, trip visit here um, during his abolition um, uh, tour. Um, no need for clothing and its iterations, centralise text and image within the work and inform works on paper as well, through, uh, like you can see around me here. Through text and image, the work demonstrates a commitment driven out of the necessity to understand my body's positioning within histories and legacies of and cultural and theoretical responses to chattel slavery and migrations in the context of black Atlantic cultural studies. I'm locating my work within histories of slavery, post-slavery and its their contemporary legacies. These contexts from where my practice operates represent the aspirational outlook my praxis is fueled by and invokes. This aspirational access that centres the contemporary legacies born out of histories of the transatlantic slave trade, the Black Atlantic, and the parallels that can be drawn between these genocidal conditions and the prison industrial complex that disproportionately police black and brown people worldwide today is articulated by Paul Gilroy who identifies, and I quote, that the need to locate cultural or ethnic roots and then to use the idea of being in touch with them as a means to refigure the cartography of dispersal and exile is perhaps best understood as a simple and direct response to the varieties of racism which have denied the historical character of black experience and the integrity of black cultures. Women's studies scholar and geographer Catherine McKittrick reinforces the resistance strategies that my praxis demands and which informs my practice and that I recognise in histories of the Black Atlantic. And I'm quoting McKittrick, the geographies of slavery, post-slavery and black dispossession provide opportunities to notice that the right to be human carries in it a history of racial encounters and innovative black diaspora practices that in fact spatialize acts of survival. Foreclosure on colonial and imperial histories in my formal education is a driving force within my practice. Gilroy articulates the pains with which creativity can retrieve life sustaining lineages and refuse capitalism's means of production as conclusive to, to existence quoting Gilroy again, artistic expression expanded beyond recognition from the grudging gifts offered by the masters as a token substitution for freedom from bondage, therefore becomes the means towards both individual self-fashioning and communal liberation. 
No Need for Clothing was first performed in its entirety at the Cooper Gallery Dundee in 2017 for a programme of exhibitions called Two Night Stands. The exhibition's curators, Linda Morris and Sophia Howe, uh, introduced me to an earlier programme at the gallery specifically of other spaces. Where does gesture become event? Featuring artists Anne Bean, Rose English, Mary Kelly, Linda and several others. The pamphlet accompanying of other spaces, described as the second of a two chapter contemporary art exhibition and event programme, lays out the foundation for how I approach the development of No Need for Clothing at Cooper Gallery. I aim to combine the spoken performance made at Spike Island earlier in the year with the drawing installation for the first time. The title of the programme acknowledges the work of Hannah Arant, who understood politics as a space of appearance, a process of being seen and heard by others. Deprived of this, and this is a quotation from the, the booklet, deprived of this, gestures, whether artistic, social or political, cannot herald in new alternatives. To do this, gestures must be provoked into becoming an event, always without precedence, an event ruptures and shatters how ourselves and the world appear. Transgressing prejudices and um, assumptions, an event is a moment that declares another world is possible. Summoning the spirit of Arendt's space of appearance, chapter two proposes the body itself as an event, standing among and between others. The body is a resistant otherness, queering and questioning its own appearance, protesting and speaking, confronting and mythologizing. This questioning body utters its answer in performance. So this idea relates to Hannah Arendt's words and deeds from her book, The Human Condition. My praxis subsequently seeks to maintain communality as a cure from the myth of the artist's genius and the centrality of individualism. I construct texts from my research, conversations and imagination for No Need for Clothing and its iterations. My method is to graft one text, image, song, poem, conversation on to another, on a, onto another ad infinitum. I draw these texts onto the walls of spaces I am invited to perform the work in. This malleable material, its construction and presence in the performance drawing installation makes attempts to a not long overdue historical, theoretical and embodied considerations of the Black Atlantic and my place as a post-colonial subject who continues to live and work from the site of significant racialized and gendered trauma. I've come to recognize that blackness is pathologized both in the US and here in the UK. I learn from US scholars and artists, abolitionists and activists, because from both my reading and research and friendships and conversations with American artists and scholars, I note that US conversations about racialized identities and blackness, structural racism and whiteness seem to be further advanced than conversations in the UK. Gilroy notes how seductive African-American forms of identity are in the UK. The United States of America and the United Kingdom foster individuals living under similar but very different racisms and histories. Um, and a conflation that undermines the specifics of the British context is useful only for generating homogenous and global identities, perpetuating the new cultural imperialism, if you will, with distinctions and peculiarities stripped of necessary knowledges to resist racialized subordination to whiteness. And I'll conclude with um, that No Need for Clothing and its iterations um, use drawn and spoken text, text drawn through and with the body as a device to work through embodied material conditions that a reciprocity between words, bodies and materiality can address. I make attempts in the work I make, whether performative or on paper, video or spoken, to refine and edit towards an aesthetic that can simply get my abolitionist, memorialist messages across. By exposing myself in the work, the performance drawing installation speaks a little of the vulnerability that is apparent through the sheer and opposing defiant act of nakedness, but the vulnerability that is apparent through um, it troubles our feminisms and troubles um, these notions um, around uh, blackness. Place naked in the um, space of the gallery, we might become alert 
to the words and deeds indicated within the text panels, charging the material charcoal with the tensions, vulnerabilities and strength demanded by the female naked labouring body. Thank you. Jade, thank you so much. That was such a dynamic and um, incredible insight into your relationship with well, a particular drawing in some senses, but also just um, the way drawing can accommodate such kind of radicalism and deep thinking um, and communicate it so directly and viscerally. Um, so thank you very much for that exchange. Um, Callum, if you're ready to share um, your drawings and your relationship with drawing, uh, which has a very particular um, relationship with the landscape and uh, surroundings um, of Scotland. Very. Uh, I first met Callum during um, a drawing course uh, where he revisited being a student at uh, Duncan Jordanston um, and yeah it's, it's a very impressive relationship with land. So over to you Callum. Thank you Tanya. Um, okay, so this evening <clears throat> I'm going to talk through some of my drawing practice <clears throat> before sharing a little about what it is to be an artist and a graduate of DJ CAD. So my drawing uh, practice is completely intertwined with the landscape. It's often used as a tool to stretch time and experiences spent in the wild and bring those experiences home and into the studio and into my imagination. Most of my drawings look at rock. I started drawing rocks because I found them to be a magnetic force for my concentration. I could happily pass hours and days getting lost in notches and gullies. I'd imagine myself at every scale exploring the, camp, the landscape I was creating. I would imagine I was a 10 metre tall giant or a microscopic weevil exploring these stony surfaces. A similar thing would happen with time. When drawing rocks, I felt I could become as old or as young as the sky, and so could the rocks. Drawing worked in this way as a key at the beginning of my practice. It opened a small, quiet loft in my brain where I could go on wild adventures of the imagination, while my hands slowly extended the world in which I could adventure. This was a solemn, quiet, and isolated activity. My early rocks often wanted to exist in isolation, carving out large areas of space to be filled in by the imagination or scattered across an empty plain. They could be floating or falling or stuck in the snow. Finding ways to connect with the natural world has always been the main consideration in my work. Having grown up here, this is a drawing of where I grew up from memory, <laughs> um, and experiencing the idyllic childhood of a hobbit being out amongst the trees and hills has always been important to me. Sadly, I don't think there's nearly enough time and resources dedicated to allowing people to access and enjoy the true beauty of this world, which we speak so much of protecting. While representational drawings have been one way to connect with nature, I've increasingly looked for other ways to experience and draw the landscape while actually being part of it. On a residency in Arden and Merkin in 2017 and wanting to explore this new landscape with fresh eyes, I decided to take a drawing for a walk, or rather make a drawing by going for a walk. Hitching a piece of canvas to my belt and dragging it along for miles along the coastline, a dialogue opened between my movement and the land itself. I didn't have to wear out my eyes and fingertips to make a drawing as I'd previously believed. I could just walk, feeling the weight of my drawing grow as it followed me around. I've repeated this drawing several times, uh, once on Mount Etna, once in Mull, and once in Norway for a touring collaborative exhibition called Ebb and Flow. In the making of each drawing, the landscape and season played their part, and in each drawing was faced an internal battle between control and lack of. Would walking through that rusty puddle a few more times be cheating on my drawing, I would think? Would avoiding the stream be a good idea so as not to wash the drawing away, or would that be interfering with my natural movement? It's remarkable how quickly you can forget rules that you've just set for yourself. This relinquishing of control in drawing took on a new form when collaborating in 2020 with Rona Jack. Authorship of an artwork can be an interesting consideration when collaborating, so Rona and I chose to recruit a silent or at least speechless partner to confuse the matter further. Over the course of three months, we set up a series of machines and conditions which would allow the wind and the rain to make drawings themselves. This was the first machine, which we called Strings Trough Turbine. 
in which the wind turned a fan, which in turn rotated paper through an ink-filled trough while being scribbled upon by ink-soaked string. The idea had been to walk away and inspect the results later on, but watching a drawing being made is completely hypnotic. We expectantly wasted for, waited for each gust of wind to activate our machine, agonising over the orientation of this ridiculous piece of hardware. We bound all of the sheets of paper into this book, into a series of books. Our second machine, which we called Ode to Nisa, involved tying charcoal to uh, strings and suspending them over a stretched canvas, giving them mobility by attaching bags to the strings. The bags would turn in unison, all agreeing on the same motion in the same instant. This machine we called Man in the Bath. We hoped to make a pinball drawing machine. The wind would turn a fan at the top of the machine, which would spin a yogurt pot with a hole in it. This would release ceramic balls, which hurtled down these slides, and then they were released onto the paper through a puddle of ink. You can see the drawings it made here. So they would all bounce down, and then at the end, you'd have all these strange marks of movement. Um, anyway, these works were a holiday from a drawing practice, which typically follows me wherever I go. I'm slowly learning that such holidays are important, with an act as natural to the body as drawing, having both seasons of growth and of reflection seem similarly natural. Finally, I'd like to share with you my most recent work, which is called 86 Bricks. This work is most cl closely linked with my life in Dundee. When drawing my first rocks at DJ CAD, a tutor suggested that I go to visit the Arbroath Cliffs, a spectacular spot a few miles north of Dundee. Throughout my nine years living here, this is the first place I bring any visitors and they represent a big part of why living here is special for me. I had the idea for this drawing while pondering the role of photography and our experience of natural beauty. Rarely would I visit a beach or forest without first screening it on the internet to see if it met my standards of beauty. Once there, I would spend a good deal of my time trying to record this beauty with my camera before taking my photos home, opening the editor, and trying to amp up those levels of beauty to something that nature couldn't compete with. These are my first experiences of our both cliffs. On returning there, I realized I created a fiction in my photographs. They were completely divorced from the place they tried to show off and instead felt more about the hardware and the position of the camera than the place itself. The cliffs were less tall, less gnarly, the sky less blue, and the ocean calmer than I'd, expect, than I'd remembered. I decided to lean into this and rebuild the Arbroath Cliffs for myself. Working from the bank of photos I captured over the years, I created 86 drawings from dozens of perspectives and distances to stitch together my fantasy and memory of the Arbroath Cliffs. On canvas and paper, the drawing grew piece by piece, moving around the room. Pushing against, it pushed against its boundaries and it strained to fill the room and to feel as big as the cliffs used to feel. This drawing is growing again. The net has now widened to try and create a geological head deck which can, encompasses the whole of the east coast of Scotland. I'm hoping to eventually grow this drawing in such a manner that it can be divided and repurposed to fit new spaces and new whims of my imagination. What I find most remarkable about the nature of a drawing practice is that each new drawing can create and describe the conditions and laws of a new world, allowing someone with any surface and something pointy to keep the world permanently new. And just to conclude, I'm just going to say a bit about what it means to be a graduate of DJ CAD and what living in Dundee is like as an artist. I was first attracted by the freedom which the contemporary art practice course offered. The art school is your oyster and you don't have to specialise. I would have access to any workshop I wanted. I arrived and I felt the sun on my face day after day. I realised that 20 minutes on a bicycle could have you getting battered by wind on a beach or scrambled around in a forest. I quickly realised the incredible sense of community that comes with living in a smallish city. Over years living here, I've crossed paths with dozens of creatives and locals while working on various jobs and projects. At all times, the art college has felt at the centre of everything, with the doors always open, even when they were closed over lockdown. I still, felt, I still frequently speak to technicians and tutors from the art college, receiving help and wisdom as my practice developed. The volume of collaboration, skill sharing, job sharing and buying and swapping of artwork within this community is remarkable. From where I've been sitting, it seems that a mentality prevails in Dundee, that the health and breadth of the com creative community is of greater value than any personal achievement or ambition. Each show, whether it be a big name at the DCA or one night only at Woosh Gallery, is rightly given the same reverence and support. What's more, you always find the students, curators, 
technicians, tutors and directors in the same pubs, at the same gigs, at the same events, and they're all telling strangers from far off places that Dundee is surprisingly sunny. Callum, thank you for sharing both your practice and your thoughts on uh, being a creative person in Dundee. That's really very appreciated. Um, and now we're moving on to an artist based in Glasgow, so not so far away. Um, Natsumi, if you wanted to share your presentation with us. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Natsumi Sakamoto. Um, I am an artist from Japan and currently based in Glasgow. I make film and mixed media installations. I'm very honored to be here today and I'm working mainly with film and drawing is not necessarily a um, medium that um, represents my work. However, drawing itself is a very important element of my practice. Um, so today I'd like to talk about the relationship of, my, of drawing in my practice and share some of the work I have produced in Scotland. Um, I will first talk briefly about how drawing is still at the core of my practice. I studied painting in my BA in Japan and so my first encounter with fine art was painting. The image I'm showing you now were made during my BA and this is a drawing performance and animation of the drawing process. Gradually my work has included more and more narrative elements and I have moved on to time-based media. But drawing remains at the heart of my work um, as a making process and as a way of thinking. Drawing is very important when I make a storyboard or film and I always make sketches of certain scenes and gestures before film shooting. Drawings can also become animations, which I sometimes include as a part of my film. Um, my work usually begins with historical and ethnographic research and interviews. From there, it evolves into different media, such as film and installation. I will introduce some examples of my recent works. Um, this is a film and mixed media installation called uh, Robin Words of Witches, produced between 2019 and 20. The work includes a series of woodcut, silk screens, photographic works and drawings. This is the first piece I have produced since I moving to Scotland in 2019. The Rowan tree is a native tree in Scotland. I believe many of you know it, and um, it is a very popular tree with red berries. This work was inspired by the Scottish superstitions about Rowan tree as a protection from witches, which still remains today in the UK, mainly in Scotland. People still plant Rowan tree in their garden to protect them from harm. I was interested in um, due to the fact that Rowan tree are also a significant tree in northern Japan. Indigenous people in Japan called the Aino people uh, believe in, uh, also believe in Rowan tree as a protection from disease. I was interested in the similarity of this belief in different countries, but also I was attracted to this tree for personal reasons, including the fact that this that is my um, grandmother's favorite tree. Um, I focus on the relationship between Rowan trees and witches, visiting places where witch hunts took place in Scotland and interviewing women I met there and I made a film about it. So this is the view of the installation in the gallery called uh, Place Mac in South Korea. Um, I'm very interested in um, the fact that Scotland is one of the countries in Europe where a lot of people were killed by witch hunts. Uh, importantly, over 80% of the victims were women. In the book, uh, Caliban and the Witch by Italian feminist Silvia, Silvia, uh, Silvia Federici, she noted that the time of the witch hunt uh, coincided with the transition from feudalism to capitalist society in Europe. Through the witch hunt, women's power and ability were taken from society and women's role became more domestic. Women working as doctors and midwives were replaced by men and women who res resisted authority through strike and social movements were accused of heresy. 
According to Federici, the basic structure of patriarchal capitalism was founded in that period. And I think it is very important to think about this when we face various gender issues today. In particular, the gender gap in Japan, where I'm from, is very large and even today women do not have access to various everyday rights. And as I travel around Scotland, ask the women living today what their views were on witch hunts and whether the superstition of raw entry is still carried on today. The film is documentary style, organically connecting the voices of each of these women talking about raw entry and witches. Um, I have been producing this kind of film work in recent years, but at the same time, I also produce drawing in parallel. These drawings are map of the places I visited for the production of this Roman tree film. The drawings are like a description of what I saw and thought there. I believe that drawing is a very effective way to recall memories as well as using words. Drawing is especially important for me to keep the emotions of the moment, such as the various discoveries and impression I feel when I conduct interviews or visit new places. And this is a silk screen version of visual poetry using the word of the people I interviewed for making this role and tree film. I'm interest, um, interested not only in using word as narration in the film, but also in creating images from, from scratch using word as material. The work is based on hand-drawn drawings, which are digitally designed and, and made a silk screen print. And this is a woodcut of a reversed black and white drawing copied from an illustration in News from Scotland, a book written by King James VI in 1591 that triggered the spread of witch hunts in Scotland. This was hung from the ceiling and displayed alongside a film as a part of installation. I went to see the actual book in the British Library and took a photograph of the book. Then I kept tracing and copying the image of the illustration in the book uh, on a piece of paper in order to understand the image well. Reading a language of old books is quite difficult for me and as I'm not a history expert, I can't really understand every inch of this book. However, I thought it was important to touch the actual published book and to use my sense of touch, sight, smell and to encounter this historical material. And the important thing is to know how to translate it into my own language. And I believe that drawing helps this translation part. In this way, while producing my film work, I'm still using my hand to draw images and words. Drawing is not always shown in the final presentation, but it is important for me as a part of the research process, especially when I'm researching in a new and unfamiliar place for me and encountering the local history. I sometimes feel a certain distance between the research material and myself due to language barrier and lack of knowledge. When I was working on this row and tree film with very little knowledge of Scottish history, I was often at a loss, unable to understand old materials and languages. However, I gradually came to realize that the experience of encountering the archival material in whatever form is research. That is, research is not only about the experience of understanding something logically through words. Drawing is a means of contemplating what information and sensations I have received from the material. So looking at the image again and again, interpreting it in my own way and drawing it, the drawing the sub object gives me a very physical sensation of taking the history into my body. I believe that through this kind of ritual like act, we can establish a more intimate relationship between history and ourselves. Uh, so this is the final one. Uh, so I'm going to run a workshop ex 
experiment, experimental drawing workshop using archival image uh, focusing on the history of women's work in Dundee uh, on the 30th of March. I would like to explore the archive and how we read these images and I would like to experiment with various ways to use drawing as a way to translate these archival images. And I would like to focus on materiality and anonymity of archival image thinking about the distance between us and the archival image and how we can build an intimate relationship to history. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Natsumi. Um, that was a really rich insight into your practice and how drawing informs the film work as well. So not always um, at the front of what we see in your work, but certainly um, they're informing how you communicate and how you research. Um, Olivia Plender is our final speaker for this evening, another deep thinker, deep, deep researcher that is looking at our relationships between gender, power and authority um, in her remarkable practice, which includes many things as well as Okay, so uh, Tanya asked me to start with this project, um, which is called A Stellar Key to the Summerland. And the reason for that is because it has a connection to Dundee. Um, so I came to Dundee in 2004 when I was a young artist, so almost 20 years ago. Um, and I did a residency at Dundee Contemporary Arts, which was one of my first big gigs, you could say. You know, it was one of my, one of the sort of, I was living in Dundee for four months and um, it was where a lot of the ways of working as an artist started for me. Um, so as Tanya mentioned, I do draw a lot and it's something I do probably every day um, and have done since I was a kid. But I also, you know, I make installations, videos, performances, publications, um, you know, so I inhabit a lot of different mediums. But drawing is kind of foundational um, for me. And Simon started off by saying it's the, one of the most democratic of mediums. And I think that's very much why it's always been there for me, you know, because, because it's very cheap. So when I left art school, I wanted to make, I had an idea that I wanted to make films or videos, but I couldn't afford the equipment. Um, so instead I started making comics, you know, so there I could use a very filmic language um, and all I needed was a pencil and a piece of paper and there I could tell stories in a sequential form. Um, so this is a graphic novel called A Stellar Key to the Summerland and um, it started when I was in Dundee and I encountered the Church of the Spirit which is, was, I don't know if it's still there, but at that time it was a few doors down from DCA and it's a spiritualist church. Um, and I got interested, so I started going to their events. Um, so spiritualism, some of you might know, um, uh, it started off as a movement in 1848 with the Fox Sisters, who you see represented um, in this frontispiece for the, for the book, the graphic novel that I did. Um, and they were two young sisters, teenagers, who had what we might now call a poltergeist experience. So they started to... Um, experienced kind of rappings and strange phenomena going on in their home, which was in Hydesville in upstate New York. And they managed to, or so they claimed, they managed to establish intelligent communication with this spirit. And there began this whole kind of phenomena and fashion for mediumship. So talking to the dead, um, which was a huge wave in the 19th century. And um, really when it came to Britain, became very, very popular, particularly amongst working class communities and in the north of England and Scotland. Um, I just see someone says Church of the Spirit is still there, which I'm happy to hear. Um, so I encountered this, you know, at Church of the Spirit. I started going to their spiritualist demonstrations, which is where, um, you know, it's kind of a bit like a church service, but you have a medium who communicates with spirits. and I just became really fascinated and intrigued and obsessed with this practice. Um, and it felt like, you know, when you're sitting in a spiritualist demonstration, you're in a group. And I always think it's something a bit like group therapy. You know, you're sort of there with a group of absolute strangers 
um, witnessing these very intimate, very moving conversations that they're having with their dead relatives, you know. So, for example, one time, you know, I remember sort of witnessing, um, you know, kind of the medium um, was apparently communicating with the dead father of a very sort of like hard elderly man, you know, who looked like he probably hadn't cried in about 40 years, you know, and then through this conversation with the dead father, you know, kind of, he started crying, you know, the dead father apologized for having been hard on him. You know, it's a very kind of intense emotional experience, but there's also a lot of graveyard humor, you know, it's really funny and it's, um, tends to be run by women and you get these really sort of feisty, um, very charismatic elderly women who are having the time of their life, you know, up on the platform being the mediums. And then there was this kind of ethos that I got interested in where they talk about how, you know, they sort of constantly tell you, you know, kind of any, any of you could be up here, you know, any of you could be doing this. All you've got to do is a little bit of training. Um, and I became interested in that. And then I started researching the history of the movement. And it's kind of like, you know, I was intrigued by why it had this sort of, you know, kind of flavor of, you know, these kind of independent women, you know, very egalitarian atmosphere, um, you know, encouraging kind of participate to be, you know, that you could also be the medium, um, which is the opposite of the Catholic Church, which is the religious background I come from, you know, which is very, very hierarchical, very top down. Um, there's no chance I could ever become a priest, you know, especially as a woman. Um, it's something else. It reflects a different political ethos. So, um, yeah, this is just uh, some of the pages from the book. This is, this is the Fox sisters when they first begin to encounter the spirit. And um, the history of the spiritualist movement um, got very tied up with progressive political causes. And that's what this graphic novel focuses on in a way. I wanted to sort of tell that history. Um, so when spiritualism first became a phenomenon, you know, it was, it was a kind of huge media. The Fox sisters were sort of big in the media. You know, they, they managed somehow to really sort of publicize what was going on. And then they very quickly took themselves to the nearest big town and started a career, you know, and they were two young women um, stepping out of the norm of what women were allowed to do and expected to do. And then the first people they got involved with was a couple called the Posts, um, who were Quakers, and they were part of the Underground Railroad, you know, which was the sort of secret network um, running through the US that would transport runaway slaves from the south of the US up to Canada and to freedom, you know. So the, from the very beginning, it was kind of tied up with the abolitionist movement um, and these, you know, a lot of progressive causes. And when it came to the UK, it became very linked to the cooperative movement. Um, so for example, you have figures like Robert Owen, who set up New Larnock, you know, the kind of, um, which is a sort of, I mean, he's described as a utopian socialist and New Larnock is often described as a kind of model factory that became a kind of model for the welfare state um, that we have today, um, but in the 19th century. He later became a spiritualist, you know, so all of that kind of spirit of, co -op, you know, the cooperative movement, anti-slavery movement, also feminism, you know, kind of came into it. And for women at that time, it was really a way of, um, I think it provided a way of finding a voice, you know, it, because, Spiritualism was open to a lot of people who didn't have the chance to engage in a university education. A lot of spiritualists didn't have the chance to engage in any kind of education. Um, and you get these fantastical stories about how, you know, kind of um, dead philosophers, you know, would teach people to read. So, for example, you know, a very popular one was Emanuel Swedenborg, who's an 18th century Swedish philosopher. Um, or Thomas Paine, the 19th century political radical, was another popular spirit who would come through. And then sometimes these spirits, um, you know, being channeled by these female mediums, would give speeches about why women should have the vote. And for me, like, it was never important to question whether this, you know, whether, whether this is true or not, or whether, you know, whether the spirits are real or not. All of that has, you know, I've always sort of approached that as an irrelevant question. Because what, what's really interesting to me is, is the dynamics, you know, that are created through this practice um, and how, you know, it created a possibility for a woman to stand on a platform and give a lecture about why women should have the vote, you know, um, but channeling a male speaker. So it also becomes this very kind of queer practice, you know, and sometimes you get male mediums channeling female speakers. 
it's a very odd, you know, very kind of um, queer practice, you could say. Yeah, so this is a different project. Um, so from that Spiritions project, um, I, you know, all the way back in 2004, sort of figured out a way of working with history. And I'm extremely interested in how history is written. Um, and sort of I'm interested in the bits that get left out of the mainstream history and thinking about why they do, you know, which is, as we all know, history is written by the victims, it's written by the powerful. Um, so I'm interested in the history of the unpowerful. And then with this project, this is a very recent project um, from a couple of years ago um, that was looking at the suffragette movement. So that's a moment in British history that's very well known, but I think has been absolutely misrepresented a lot of the time. Um, so part of what's written out of the story is the queerness. You know, a lot of the suffragette women were in same-sex relationships. A lot of them ended up, you know, living these very kind of what we would now think of as queer lives. Um, you know, but a lot of, also another part that's very contested is the level of violence, you know. So this, this is a series um, of drawings that I made. It was shown at the Sao Paulo Biennial as part of a big installation, which also included um, uh, a two-channel video work. Um, which was about violence, and it was, I was um, thinking about the level of violence it takes to create social change, and it's a whole series of works that I've been, um, I tend to work on projects for a very long time, um, you know, years and years and years, and then different things come out of it, you know, sometimes drawings, sometimes publications, sometimes installations, films, um, and with this I was thinking, I was contrasting the kind of structural violence, um, you know, that the state and society create in people's intimate personal lives with this sort of, you know, this kind of very direct kind of violence. So this series um, is called Arrest, and it's just, um, you know, the series of suffragettes being arrested over and over and over again. And the policemen always appear to be more or less the same person. You know, and in this series with the repetition, you sort of see these very different individual women, you know, and you and the sort of effect of the uniform, how, you know, kind of the uniform turns these policemen always into the same, almost the same person, you know, the kind of representative of the state. Um, so this was part of the research behind this project, um, you know, which, as I said, had many different outcomes, that drawing series being one of them, um, was... Uh, kind of basically I I found a play written by Sylvia Pankhurst who was you know one-man suffragette part of the famous Pankhurst family but what's unique about her is that she was a socialist feminist so she was running part of running this group called the East London Federation of Suffragettes who were working on a much wider range of issues than just votes for women which is what the suffragette movement is known for so they were also working with you know kind of housing issues domestic violence, unequal pay, um, living and working conditions, you know, many different issues that are still relevant to feminism today. Um, and I set up, I found this play written by Sylvia Pankhurst, and then I set up this series of meetings with um, three different groups in London who work in similar ways to the East London Federation of Suffragettes, but today. So, the East London Federation of Suffragettes, you know, they had a network of women's centres in East London. Um, and the groups that I worked with, you know, they one was a women's centre, one was a group campaigning on housing issues, another was a refugee women's group. Um, and, you know, they're community organisers. Um, they have a sort of a way of working in a set of issues that, that overlapped, you know, had overlap with the East London Federation of Suffragettes. And I wanted to look at this history through their eyes. Um, and I had a feeling that, you know, these women who have a practice of community organizing and activism um, would read that history very differently to how an academic historian would read it, you know, because, because of that practice, because they have an embodied knowledge of what it is um, to do activism, to make political change happen, you know, and all the sort of networks of care and ways of being together um, that you need in order to make that happen. So this play was kind of a tool and we set up these meetings where we would sort of read it together You know, we would perform it. We'd rewrite it. Oh, yeah, here's the play itself 
Um, here's just some of the drawings that came out of it. So I ended up making a publication where I published the play, which has never been published before, as a tool so that other people can also use it to think about their history and think about um, the issues that come out of it. And then I also published um, a lot of the material from the meetings that we'd had. And then I made these drawings. Um, and the reason these were drawings and not photographs was because many of the women that I worked with, you know, were in vulnerable positions. So, for example, you know, um, the group on the bottom right are called Focus East 15, and they're a housing activist group. You know, many of them are struggling with issues of homelessness um, and having, you know, having sort of difficult confrontations with the police, with the authorities, um, with social services. You know, as I mentioned, there's also a refugee women's group. Many of them have issues with the Home Office, immigration issues. So I didn't want to show anybody's faces, you know, through photographs. I didn't want people to be identifiable. But at the same time, I wanted to represent the atmosphere of these of these meetings, you know, this kind of round table um, situation, you know, sitting in a circle, which is very characteristic of meetings in feminist spaces. Um, you know, the tea and coffee in the background, the sort of texture of those spaces. Um, so the book is full of these kind of drawings which, which tell you something about the, you know, about the sort of texture of community organizing and what it is to sit in one of these kind of um, spaces, sort of women-led spaces. Um, and then, uh, and this is a comic that I started working on um, in March 2020 for probably obvious reasons, um, because all of this kind of um, socially engaged work that I was doing, all the sort of meetings with women's centres and people ground to a halt when COVID happened. Um, and suddenly I was back to the beginning. I was sort of trapped in my bedroom with a pencil and a piece of paper and no access to anything else. So I started to make this comic called The History of Animal Kingdom, which is a political satire based on pretty much everything we've all lived through in the last couple of years. And it's about a nation of chickens, which is ruled over by this owl that you see, who's called Prince Hoo Hoo Hoo. Um, and, you know, he's, he's fairly incompetent um, at his job. There's a lot of corruption. You know, you'll recognize bits of Boris Johnson, bits of Trump, bits of, you know, different political leaders. Um, there's a sort of meta commentary on the media, you know, running through it. Um, and I, I did it basically, you know, as a kind of way of entertaining myself during that really deeply miserable time, but also to entertain my friends. So I started posting it on Instagram um, every Saturday, you know, during the first lockdown to basically keep my friends entertained, you know, to sort of cheer people up and to cheer myself up. Um, so again, you know, back to kind of drawing is this very sort of democratic tool, very kind of cheap and cheerful um, and very contingent, you know, it's something that's always available which is, as I said, why I returned to it, I think. Okay, so I'm going to end there. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. That, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, and, you know, like, like so many of the presentations this evening, just reminding us of what an important tool of communication drawing is. Um, but I, I've, I've just been amazed at the sort of depth of thinking in all these presentations, the richness of drawing as a form to communicate across time, across kind of real, really kind of complex issues, to communicate our emotions, our sense of place, and how we demark our place in the world as well and communicate that to others. So, um, I, I'm just so grateful <laughs> to have been able to gather these people to, together to have this conversation this evening. Um, I wanted to also remind you that this is the first of a series of events. Um, we have another event on Thursday um, chaired by Gary Sangster that's looking at the Lines of Sight exhibition and the drawings that are in that. Um, that will be um, 6.30 on Thursday UK time um, 
my wonderful colleague Alex Roberts is running um, another drawing discussion, drawing as collaboration, discovering a new language, and that's on the 31st of March in the evening. And there will be some in-person workshops with Zoe Gibson and Natsumi Sakamoto. So all the all this information is on on the Cooper website. You can book in through Eventbrite because um, we really hope that these discussions will encourage others to make drawings and so many of our panelists have talked about how, how they found their voice through drawings and that's either through the drawings of others and understanding place or particular kind of um, yeah relationship with places that they see in the work of others or through their own practice. Um, and also to remind you that our panelists are supplying drawing prompts so I would hope that this isn't just a listening experience, that I, I would hope that these conversations, these presentations generate drawings as well. I would just like to um, say thank you again to our wonderful panel, Simon, Lucy, Jade, Callum, Natsumi and Olivia. Thank you to uh, the wonderful facilitation from Cooper Gallery and the invitation from Trinity Boy Wolf to convene this conversation this evening. Um, so I think that will probably be it from us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for giving us your attention for this event. <laughs>